بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of Dar al-Athar Islamiyah, I wish you all a happy new year. Hoping that this new year will bring you happiness, health, and wealth. Not necessarily in that order, but it will be nice. Tonight, Dar al-Athar Islamiyah is most happy to present a lecture by Dr. Kim Benzel, I hope it's right, of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Since her affiliation with the museum in 1990, starting as a graduate assistant in the Department of uh, Near Eastern Art, then curator assistant, and currently curator in charge, she has had an active and intense involvement with the area of the master's and PhD studies, ancient Mesopotamia. In addition to excavation experience, particularly in Syria, she participated with curatorial teams in contributing and co-authoring to the catalogs of these exhibitions. She has delivered lectures and contributed essays, <coughs> excuse me, essays, and participated in long list of conferences, symposia, and workshops. <coughs> Dr. Benzel is a dynamic scholar. I'm sure Sheikh Hassa will agree with me on that. Dynamic scholar who has put her extensive experience into producing innovative projects. She co-authored a resource, a resource guide to the museum for kindergarten through high school teachers. At present, she and her colleagues are involved in a full re-imaging and renovation of the Metropolitan's permanent galleries of ancient Near East art. The, talk, the title of Dr. Benzel's discussion is Sites of Enchantment, Early Dynastic Jewelry from the Royal Cemetery at Ur, Mesopotamia. Her stated intention through this is to argue that this jewelry entitled Technology of Enchantment and the Enchantment of Technology. The technology of the mobile phones will enchant us if you turn them off. So let's welcome Dr. Kim Benzel. Hello and good evening to all of you and thank you for that very, very warm welcome. Um, thank you for coming out on this very rainy evening as well, a special thank you for that. First, I would like to thank Her Excellency Sheikh al Hussa, Sabah, al Salam, al Sabah, with all my heart for the kind and generous invitation to come speak here at the Dar al Athar al Islamiya um, for its 27th cultural season. It is such a great honor and privilege to be here, and for the first time, by the way, in Kuwait. Um, to share my deep and abiding respect for the people and the cultures of the ancient Middle East who crafted extraordinary artworks so many millennia ago. I'd also like to thank, most sincerely, I don't think she's here, um, Mrs. Shri Kumari Nair and Mr. Walid Thakur, who is here, as well as all the many colleagues um, who helped organize my itinerary, my talk, and all aspects of my visit so perfectly. And again, my thanks goes to all of you this evening who are here to, to hear this talk. So while the title slide is up, um, I want to note that I was actually a practicing goldsmith before I pivoted to a career in art history and museums. 
Making jewelry was actually my first love right out of college, and I've always retained that interest and fascination with jewelry and how it was crafted throughout my academic career. In many ways, it is what connects me most directly to Kuwait, but that is a much longer story <laughs> next time I come. Which is all to say that, gold, that my goldsmithing background informs the basis of this talk, which is technological in its focus. I chose this topic because the jewelry arts of Mesopotamia, of the ancient world in general, are often relegated to the decorative or minor arts whereas they are anything but, and I hope to demonstra demonstrate that to you tonight. And in order to do that, and by way of introduction, as well as by um, explanation of the title of this talk, I think I'm going to put this up a little higher. I keep having to duck down to get the sound. I will begin by quoting Alfred Gell, a British social anthropologist whose work in the 1990s had a profound impact on art history. The following passage comes from Gell's famous 1992 essay titled The Technology of Enchantment and the Ta Enchantment of Technology. And here I quote, the power of art objects stems from the technical processes they objectively embody. The technology of enchantment is founded on the enchantment of technology. The enchantment of technology is the power that the technical processes have of casting a spell over us so that we see the real world in an enchanted form. Art, as a separate kind of technical activity, only carries further through a kind of involution the enchantment which is imminent in all kinds of technical activity. That's a lot to take in, but I'm going to unpack that now. That's the end of the quote. So now to my talk. Proper. When scholars investigate the issue of identity in the ancient world, they first and foremost rely on inscribed evidence, if it exists, such as names and titles. In the absence of such labels, they try to glean information about a person by assessing the context in which they functioned through the processes of archaeology, anthropology, and art history, among other methods. Traditionally, such inquiries have tended to focus on what the material culture associated with the person reveals or reflects about their identity. Only occasionally were the objects among a person's possessions considered capable of actively creating that identity. In Mesopotamia, however, there are indications, and we know this from the many texts that survive, the cuneiform tablets that survive, that identity could, not, could inhere not just in the organic body, but also in inorganic objects that were in contact with the body. Um, Zainab Bahrani has explained this phenomenon, of, she's a, a scholar, a professor at Columbia University in New York, has explained this phenomenon as follows, and I quote, Inorganic objects such as garments, jewelry, and other decorations and belongings, even cylinder seals, were all associated with the body and could stand in for the person in a very real sense. They, became, they could become objects with agency. In other words, agency is a difficult concept <laughs> when you don't explain it. In other words, objects otherwise considered inanimate were not limited to passive, decorative, or symbolic functions. They could affect, imbue, and animate other things and even beings. It is with this concept in mind that I approach, that I approach the topic of jewelry today, not as mere ornament, insignia, or representation of personal identity, but as an active participant in the very formation of that identity. Moreover, I will extend this logic to include how the jewelry in question, and thus identity, was actually manufactured, both physically and conceptually. Heather Lechtman long ago pioneered the idea that technology could be read or understood in ways analogous to artistic style and iconography. And here again I quote, technologies are performances 
They are communicative systems, and their styles are the symbols through which communication occurs. The relationship among the formal elements of the technology establishes style, which in turn becomes the basis of a message on a larger scale." End quote. What follows is such a technological case study, focusing on one of the most renowned corpuses of burial jewelry from the ancient world. I have to find the pointer. Among the most important archaeological discoveries of the 20th century was the so-called Royal Cemetery at the site of Ur in southern Mesopotamia, modern Iraq, and dating to roughly 2500 BCE. So Ur is underlined here. Um, so it's very close. <laughs> and we're actually in our department um, part participating, partnering with the University of Pennsylvania at a site right nearby and extending those excavations to Ur. So maybe one year we can invite you to come see what's happening there. Then this is um, the site, an aerial photograph of Ur. The cemetery is what's circled here. And these are all the rubbish dumps, like the dirt that got thrown out of um, the excavation. So this is the actual cemetery from the 1920s, and you can still see them on the satellite photograph. Um, so it's really quite, it's actually within the city walls of the city of Ur, which is also quite unusual, and that's another lecture. Um, excavations in the cemetery yielded close to 2,000 graves and tombs, the most lavish of which contained an astonishing array of grave goods, as well as evidence of human sacrifice, the only time that we know of in Mesopotamia. Today, the finds are split between the Iraq Museum in Baghdad, the British Museum in London, and the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Philadelphia. The jewelry found buried in those tombs dating to the th mid-third millennium BCE comprises one of the earliest and richest extant assemblages of gold, silver, and precious stones to survive from antiqui antiquity, and figures as one of the most well-known and often illustrated aspects of Sumerian culture. With a few notable exceptions, most scholars have interpreted these jewels primarily as a reflection in burial of a significant level of power and prestige among the ruling kings and queens of Ur at the time, hence the name Royal Cemetery. Despite the fact that little inscribed evidence was unco uncovered to support this characterization, I, don't be I believe it is royal, but I believe it's more than that. I believe that the jewelry was not simply a rich but passive collection of prestige goods, but rather that it can be understood in terms of active ritual, even cultic production, thereby creating an identity for its wearer in death that was different from that of royalty alone. It can be many things in Mesopotamia. So keep that in mind for later. To make my point, I will focus on one of the most elaborate sets of jewelry at Ur, that belonging to a female named Pu'abi, who is identified by name on a cylinder seal. This is her full, this is how she appears at the University of Pennsylvania right now. They recently reinterpreted how the jewelry, and, and the excavations by Sir Leonard Woolley in the 1920s, I mean, the, the field notes are extraordinary. I mean, he, you know, drew every bead and documented every single thing that was found. So they have a pretty good idea that this is how she would have been reconstructed. And of course, they also, Woolley did cast, um, some of the, the female attendants into plaster and brought them back. So this is literally how these bodies looked in excavation when they were excavated. Um, so the cylinder seal um, is here. So this is Puabi in burial. This is her cylinder seal, and this is the seal rollout. This is the ancient seal, and this is the inscription, um, which is how she's identified as Puabi. Enticingly, as regards her um, identity, the name is qualified with a title, but it is a rather ambiguous one used for a variety of positions, including lady, princess, queen, 
priestess, and even goddess, or a purposeful conflation, sort of collapsing of all of them, which is what I, I have argued elsewhere that I believe some version of the latter is true, despite the fact that most scholars opt for the designation of queen only, a queen to a king. Royal, and, and there's no king involved in this burial, so that's confusing too. Royal and cultic identities are not mutually exclusive in Mesopotamia, in fact, quite the opposite. So the ornaments fashioned from gold, particularly those adorning Puabi's head, appear on the surface to be rather simple in technique, made primarily of undecorated hammered sheet gold. However, by examining these pieces closely, it becomes apparent that the methods used to hammer and assemble the pieces were deceptively complicated and time consuming. Before I continue, this is the previous reconstruction of Puabi's headdress. So I'm using it because it's easier. It's, that has changed very little from the image I just showed you, um, but it's easier to sort of see where the different parts are. These are the two leaf headdresses, then this one is sort of buried, tucked under there, and then the comb on there. Um, there seems to have been a, a, some sort of premium placed on fashioning individual elements from a single piece of gold whenever possible, even at the cost of additional labor intensity. The making of this jewelry is also noteworthy for its prescriptive-like consistency and for its focus on and repetition of re a restricted technical repertoire. The process of production thus required not only substantial material resources, obviously quite a lot of gold, um, but also considerable and coordinated investment of human energy, consisting of craftspeople both skilled in mechanical techniques and knowledgeable in the techniques of seemingly dictated specifications. And we'll, we'll talk about that. A certain amount of advanced planning would therefore have been necessary to form Puabi's assemblage because the individual pieces were made in a highly prescriptive way that suggests that they were conceived together. These were not jewels collected over a lifetime or retained as heirlooms and then buried with Puabi simply because they belonged to her. They were made as part of one procedure and for a particular purpose, the burial of Puabi. Although a complete analysis of the materials and methods used to create all of Puabi's jewelry, as was done for my doctoral dissertation many years ago, is not feasible here for reasons of time, I will present a small selection of the jewels in question and describe how they were fashioned. <clears throat> Beginning at the top of Puabi's body with the large hair comb, it becomes apparent on closer, is this reverberating? I kind of, is it okay, the sound? Yeah, okay. It becomes apparent on closer inspection that a tremendous effort was made to create this large and heavy ornament out of as few pieces of gold as possible and without evident use of any joining medium other than the purely mechanical. The body of the comb was made out of very large, very thick sheet gold that most likely began as a solid mass, probably in an elongated shape, like an ingot or something. In order to plan for and achieve from a single piece of gold, the wire pin at the one end and the wide splay into seven prongs on the other, the goldsmith must have possessed an intimate knowledge of the mechanics and movements of gold as it was hammered repeatedly. While the comb appears simply made in the sense that its body has no decoration or ornamentation, the process of hammering such a large piece of gold requires tremendous feel for the metal as well as time and patience. All metals harden and become brittle as they are worked, especially by hammering. They require constant heating and reheating to regain their malleability for further hammering or for other kinds of manipulation. This is called annealing in modern terminology, technical terminology. If they are not annealed properly and often enough, metals simply stop rep responding and become so brittle that they show cracks and fissures. They can even split or break into pieces, and this is an important point. 
you can see, um, in fact, hints of such stress fractures, marks, um, are observable at five of the six points where the body of the comb divides into the seven prongs. Gold in its native state, that is gold between 70 and 90% pure, is thought of as extremely malleable and ductile. <clears throat> Indeed, in smaller amounts, this is true. It is certainly more malleable than gold that is further alloyed with silver, copper, or other materials, other, or other baser metals. However, many of the gold ornaments found with Puabi, all of which likely fall within the purity range of native gold, were made from rather substantial single pieces of metal, which entailed enough hammering to shape into their respective forms that the metal would have become quite work-hardened in the course of manufacture and therefore required considerable kneel kneeling along the way. So this is, um, I was lucky enough when I did the work many years ago on this collection um, to be locked in the vault of the University of Pennsylvania storeroom for months on end. And I even had a microscope available to me. And this, so this is the microscope photography um, that was done. So even smaller ornaments, including extensions such as the sp suspension loops that I will discuss shortly, no longer qualify them as small enough an amount to be easily worked without constant annealing. So this is, for instance, if you go, well, I'm going to go forward because I come back to this. This is the leaf of the headdress. It's one continuous long tail that was hammered out like this and then rolled up. There's absolutely no reason to do this. If, you know, technically, I mean, one can do this many other ways. I'll come back to that. Um, in the case of the comb, I imagine that the goldsmith would have begun hammering at one end of the short ends, one of the short ends of the elongated solid gold mass, first to secure enough length for the wire pin at the one end, and then to continue with the large flat surface that makes up the body. They would have needed to anneal the metal scores and scores and scores of times for this much gold to remain malleable enough to be hammered successfully into the sizable body of its completed form. The process of annealing each time is not a particularly speedy one, in addition to being highly repetitive. The metal must be heated evenly and carefully so as to achieve maximum compliance, but not to melt or blister it. The constant annealing required in order to process, to proceed with hammering, is deceivingly labor intensive and takes great skill and sensitivity. Unlike um, intricate decorative techniques such as granulation or filigree, which immediately present themselves to the viewer as difficult or time consuming, the hammering of metal does not advertise the labor and the expertise involved. The technique and the process are largely hidden and silent within the final product. The lack of technical ostentation in itself challenges the common assumption and interpretation that this jewelry was cre created primarily as a marker of royal prestige and wealth. What is also hidden within the final product made in this manner is the fact that if at the end of the hammering process, the mass of gold had not been sufficient for the desired design, then the goldsmith would have had to begin from scratch or resort to soldering or brazing additional sections to the main body. This is an important technical point when evaluating the procedural decision not to use any means of solder or baser alloy and the, cons the consequent implied skill of the goldsmith. Thus, while One's first impression of the comb is that although quite large and lovely, it is rather simply made from undecorated sheet gold. It becomes clear from even this abbreviated analysis that its manufacture was anything but simple. Now let's look at the botanical wreaths that adorn Puabi's head. Again, remember we had all those layers. Again, the predominant technique employed to make the gold elements of the wreath of the wreaths is hammering. The goldsmith, so this is each of the three in, you know, here's the full wreath, 
And you'll note that um, this one, I can't see, one of them has four strands, one is two. Um, and then these are the close-ups of each of those, just a section. Um, the goldsmiths fashioned each of the many leaves from a single unit of gold, hammering in one direction to make the leaf shape and in the other direction to form the suspension loop, which is what I was... So this is the whole leaf, and then it goes... I'll come back. I'll sh the next slide shows that. It goes straight into that tail that then folds into the suspension loop. Much like the comb was hammered in one direction to form the pin end and in the other to make the body with the splayed prongs. In the case of the wreath pendants, the shaping of each leaf was a fairly simple procedure since individually they did not involve the large amount of gold and surface area that the body of the comb did. Nonetheless, frequent annealing was required both for the hammering of the shape and for the chasing that was done to delineate the veins, the venation of the, the leaves. By examining the suspension loops that belong to each of the leaf to each leaf element and that were formed from the same piece of gold as the leaf the procedural aspect becomes more significant as with the allotting of the gold from the comb the hammering of the gold leaves entailed planning not just for the leaf design but also for the narrow strip of gold that continued beyond the fine stems and served as the suspension loop for each leaf once it had been folded into the desired shape which I already pointed out. While th the three separate wreaths have three separate designs, design variations of this loop, they share a fundamental aspect of the technique, the use of a single, continuous, and seamless piece of metal whenever possible. In the case of the two poplar wreaths, and I show only one of them here, one can see that the strip of gold extending from the leaf stem was folded and rolled, almost ribbon-like, into tubes intended for strands of beads. So we already talked about that. This is closer in, and it's that stem that you're seeing in the, under the microscope doing that, doing that, doing that, doing that. And it's each one, that's what it looks like. The amount of annealing and therefore time needed to hammer and fold each of the many loops was again considerable. Likewise, a significant amount of feel and skill were once more required to calculate and execute the movement of a single unit of gold into both the leaf shape and the suspension loop. An easier and more practical way would have been to produce multiple tubes that could be easily laid, that could be laid side by side, soldered together and subsequently attached to the leaf to form the loop. And in fact, you're sort of seeing the potential here of just making, today we would make a bunch of tubes, solder them together, um, and if something went wrong, you just replace the tube. And this is something completely within the skill set at Ur. So again, if something went wrong in the making of the ornament, one could replace one part rather than starting from scratch to create an entirely new leaf um, and loop out of a single piece of gold. The sum of making the parts separately would have required less work than the making of each leaf and loop as a coherent whole. And here you're going to have to trust me that it seems that this alternate, alternate approach would have been especially relevant since there were so many of these leaves made for Puabi and for others buried with her and throughout the cemetery. Remember that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that there were close to 2,000 graves excavated at war. Not all with these assemblages, but quite a few of them. One could quite efficiently have made each type of part in an almost production line manner and then assemble them into complete ornaments. Yet the goldsmith chose the more difficult and time-consuming method. Was this to avoid breaking the gold into various bits and thus needing to join parts, thereby compromising the seamlessness of the pieces, both physically and conceptually? Was the goldsmith circumventing the use of solder, which would have in added impurities? to the gold and compromise the physical and conceptual purity? Was there a particular method prescribed for ritual reasons? 
These are all questions that immediately come to mind once the technology has been closely examined. And that was sort of my great, you know, that was the thing that I could add because I understood, unlike, you know, most art historians who study the iconography and the final product, I had this ability to really take a close look at what was going on sort of under the hood, so to speak. And it was just astonishing. And then imagine, there are hundreds of these headdresses. And that's a whole other story which we can discuss if anyone's interested afterwards, why they're so, this is, these were all part of the, the, sacri the human sacrifices that were in these tombs. Um, but imagine how much work went into one leaf with that little tail and now multiplied literally hundreds of times. I will show one last example, that of Puabi's hair ribbon, perhaps the least <laughs> outwardly impressive of all Puabi's jewelry, yet one that constitutes a hammering tour de force. The ribbon of gold is remarkably plain and devoid of any decoration or iconography whatsoever, and therefore would never, normally never be singled out as, noteworthy, as a noteworthy object in any art historical discussion. Yet it represents the epitome of technical expertise due to the enormous amounts of skill, feel, and time and constant annealing required for its making. Hammering sheet gold into long, a long, long strip, straight strip before it got bent, such as this is exceedingly difficult to do with accuracy and without having it break at some point along the way. <clears throat> through the work hardening and splitting potential of the metal. Again, as with previous examples, the goldsmith would have had to begin from scratch if the metal were to have split, cracked, or broken. And as a quick aside, you know, I, I actually went back to the, gold, the studio, and I, I, I tried doing this in silver, which in, in pretty pure silver, which is very soft and malleable. And these are, when they're out, they're very long. And I had... Law, I, I wasn't a master goldsmith when I was doing it, but I had learned granulation. I had learned cloisonne. I could not do this. I could not do this. It kept cracking. Like maybe this far in, it would crack. It would split. Or it would go, <laughs> it would take a turn from the hammering. It, I, I, I tried it because I had to test it myself in order to make that statement. Um, it, it was such an interesting experiment. And again, Hair ribbons are part of every single set. I'm not going to discuss these amazing earrings because those were really hard to show under a microscope, but you know, that's a whole, I, I had to pick three things, otherwise we'd be here all night, so I'm sorry, next time. There'll be a chapter two if you'd like. Um, but it is, it's, it's really, um, you know, even in their completely undecorated state, such ribbons, and there are scores of them at, or in the ore burials, best exemplify the virtuosity involved in the crafting, in the craft of hammering at ore. From this brief examination of Puabi's jewelry, several technical aspects must be reiterated and stressed because they have so much, as much conceptual as technological uh, significance. First, the goldsmith must have been an expert at their craft. As we have seen, the amount of hammering into a shape such as the comb or the hair ribbon, although not a complicated technique, required considerable knowledge of the mechanics of the metal and a feel for knowing where to begin and how to hammer the gold so that all the overall design of this rather large ornament could be achieved in a seamless manner. Hammering also entailed a substantial amount of time because of the need to constantly and carefully anneal the metal. The primary components of hammering are thus feel and time, technical elements that are not evident in the final result, but requiring as much, if not more, expertise as the fanciful decorative techniques do. In other words, the expertise involved in hammering is largely hidden, but far from insignificant. Furthermore, it is crucial to know that hammering a flat sheet is the primary metalworking technique among the ornaments produced for Puabi and others. Of particular interest to me is the design decision to favor flat sheet over ornamental details, which produce surfaces that actively enhance the sheen of the gold being used and exploited the resulting reflection of light or shine. 
on a more theoretical level, this approach created in technique the semantic equivalent to the Sumerian word for shine that formed part of the Sumerian word for gold. And I'm happy to answer afterwards how that operates. Um, but the Sumer so that formed the Sumerian term for gold because shine was deemed inherent to the metal, and that is in fact true. Gold is inherently shiny and does not tarnish in a native state like that. On a more theoretical level, oh, sorry, I just did that. Furthermore, the Sumerian sign indicating shine could also signify holy or sacred. So the two concepts were often equated. Thus, I would argue that in the case of Puabi's jewelry, the technology ex itself exhibits agency and that shine and conceivably some aspect of the sacred were being deliberately produced or performed in its very making. If indeed purposeful, and I believe strongly that the technique of hammering so much flat sheet metal was very consciously chosen or prescribed even, this reinforcing of the metal, the material and semantic properties in the associated technical processes represents a subtle yet sophisticated use of repetition or doubling, a conceptual operation that is well known in the visual and literary imagery of, me imagery of Mesopotamia and seen here in technological form. Repetition on a more mechanical level is essentially a byproduct of hammering and constitutes a second aspect of manufacture at Ur that is also obscure but fundamental, once again both in its technical importance and conceptual significance. The very act of annealing, the foremost component of uh, continuous hammering, is repetition writ large and accounts in part for the tremendous amount of time expended to make Puabi's jewels yet it is not overtly appreciable in the final product, products. It is interesting to note that on a conceptual level, the act of repetition is also a key factor in ritual practice and procedure, so that the technological process of repetitive hammering conceivably supported a ritual purpose to this jewelry. <clears throat> Seamlessness was mentioned earlier and comprises a third and crucial aspect of the jewelry technology for Ur, at Ur for several reasons. Again, both physical and conceptual. For one, it entailed the use of a single piece of gold whenever possible, rather than multiple ones joined together. This technique preserved the integrity and relative purity of the gold, as well as the visual unity of the piece. The use of separate elements would have interrupted both the material and the form, and the use of qu solder quite literally would have added impuri impurities to the metal by way of the baser elements contained in solder. And then it starts to tarnish, right? For instance, by hammering the prongs out of the same piece of metal as the body of the comb and suspension loops directly out of the same metal as, the, as comprise the leaves, rather than soldering or joining by any other means, the goldsmith opted for the much more difficult but pure and more holistic method. Easier means were available during this period, so one must assume the choice was not by default but deliberate. That's very important please remember. This approach has implications concerning not only the compositional or economic value of the gold, but also the potential ritual value or symbolism of the finished object. Once again, the procedure chosen achieved in technical terms the semantic equivalent to the Sumerian word for pure that formed part of the Sumerian term for gold because, like shine, it was deemed inherent to the metal. In fact, and perhaps not surprisingly, the Sumerian sign indicating pure is the same one used for shine, which you may recall is also the one used to signify holy or sacred, suggesting that all three concepts could be conflated in certain contexts. Thus, one might argue that the technique itself had agency, that purity as well as shine and sacredness were being performed and produced in the very process of making. This consideration, in conjunction with the others mentioned, points to the possibility that Puabi's jewelry carried a cultic charge, 
which in turn could be transferred to her, its wearer's, identity. The entire progression of which was seemingly activated first and foremost by the materials and methods of manufacture. Finally, seamlessness quite literally hides the hand of the mortal maker, thereby giving, leaving open the question of who made the object and how, and giving the impression that the object simply exists rather than being made at all. A similar operation is well known for ancient Near Eastern, from ancient Near Eastern texts that describe the making of cult statues, where the process entailed rituals that purposefully obscured the role of the sculptor, allowing a statue to miraculously emerge in its fully finished and animated state as if made by the gods. I believe that a related, I'm not arguing for exactly that, but a related conceptual maneuver was likely being carried out in the technical processes chosen, chosen for the making of Puabi's jewelry. These are all hidden aspects of technology that are rarely explored because they are, for the most part, poorly understood or even completely unnoticed. Most art historians are not jewelers. Um, the finished product generally provides the starting point for all art historical investigations, leaving process and procedure <clears throat> to the fields of studio art and conservation. My aim today is to show that the procedural or technological aspects of the creative endeavor provide additional ways in which to understand jewelry. Considered in this light, the jewelry pr produced for Puabi easily fits the descriptions given in Sumerian texts of expertly fashioned, skillfully made, brought to a perfect end, and does so quite literally and physically based on the technical procedures actually used, not just on interpretations of textual references to the productions of objects. The Mesopotamian Sumerians rarely said something was beautiful. It was always beautifully made. It wasn't perfect. It was brought to a perfect end. There's, there's always, um, they're, they're always invoking in the terminology the making process. And that was very much part of the, their sense of aesthetics. <clears throat> um, as pointed out by... Sorry. As pointed out by Irene Winter, the Sumerian ter terminology for crafting reflects a great sense of value attached to the objects they describe, a value that stems as much from the skilled craftsmanship exhibited in the finished objects as from the operative values of the raw materials out of which they are made or the distinguished function they may have served. I would add that also emphasized in the wording, especially in phrases such as brought to a perfect end, was an implied mandate for a particular preconceived and prescribed procedure attached to the making of valued objects that resulted in a seamlessness, a hidden perfection, that could not but be perceived to stem from a magical or sacred source, or even in some measure activate the magical or the sacred, because it effectively erased the hand of the mortal maker. To be stressed here is the sense that at Ur, there clearly existed a correct way of making certain objects. Indeed, a procedure that was prescribed by a source other than the artist's own inspiration and creativity. Extending this logic further, I propose that the technological processes employed for Puabi's jewelry, most especially the golden ornaments worn on, worn on her head, yielded yielded specific results in the final products via techniques that were consistently repetitive, prescriptive, and aimed at maximizing the seamlessness of design and manufacture, in addition to reinforcing the properties of shine and purity, and, and purity inherent in the gold itself. In short, the making of Puabi's jewelry entailed procedural ingredients essential to ritual and cultic production, repetition, prescription, and seamlessness, all consistently applied at great additional expense of labor. In the process, some aspect of shine, purity, and possibly the sacred was being constructed in both the dead body and live image of Puabi, and thereby in her person and identity. The materials and making of her jewelry were active agents in that process. This is exactly what Alfred Gell meant by, quote, the technology of enchantment, being founded on the enchantment of technology. 
So I could say much more about the manufacture of the ornaments I have selected to show you today and about the many hundreds of others from Ur that I have not mentioned or shown you. However, what I'm most interested in, as stated all along, is the overall procedural and associated conceptual approaches to the making of puabis and other assemblages at Ur. To finish, I'd like to return to the observation made by Zainab Bahrani and cited at the start of this talk that in, Mes in the Mesopotamian mindset, identity and presence could reside not only in the organic body or biological body of a person, but also in the inorganic objects that were in contact with that body. In other words, and here I again quote Bahrani, Identity was a form of presence that could take on numerous manifestations, end quote. Considered in this light, jewelry as a category would count among the most logical of such manifestations, since it is intimately connected to the body of the wearer. Jewelry can thus become an object with agency, analogous to the case of the king's garment in the Mesopotamian substitution ritual. You touch it, it's almost like touching the, the biological person. Or the gold overlay on the statues of deities literally conceptualizes skin. Or the actual jewelry that is so closely tied to the identities and powers of the goddess Inanna Ishtar. All of, these all of these are examples of inorganic extensions of biological bodies, whether mortal or divine, and therefore as efficacious as the original itself. What I've tried to add today is the technological aspect, how such agency and identity were materially manufactured and conceptually manipulated through the technolo technology of jewelry in the burials at Orr, both as effective extensions of the persons themselves and as part of the cultic and royal activation of their identities in death, as veritable sites of enchantment. Thank you so much for listening.